a brilliant, brilliant author, by the way. Um, do look up her multiple brilliant books. Um, now, Misha, I am so glad that we can do this and talk about this and talk about the truth here because I've not been, I've just been, had a ringside seat of the saga of surrounding, I don't want to call it the Kate Clancy affair because actually the whole point about what you and others were doing was trying to broaden this conversation to the problem of the publishing industry, which is very, very white and riddled with institutional racism. Kate Clancy was a striking uh, case study. Now, I just want to bring in, before I, I speak to Manish, uh, to ask questions to Manish, just so everyone's aware of what happened, because I think this is, as I've said, such an important uh, point. So, here we go. I'm going to bring up some tweets by Kate Clancy, where she says, sorry to whinge, on Goodreads, Goodreads is a website people know where people review books. Someone made up a racist quote and said it was in my book. Other reviewers picked it up and repeated it. I've flagged the reviews many times, but it does no good. Today I got my first email threat based on it. Is there anything I can do? And then she says, another tweet, flag the reviews. None of these terms in my book. It's all made up. There's a slight problem here. These racist comments, uh, descriptions, and not just racist, classist, and all the rest of it, and we'll talk, I'll, I'll, I'll put these to Manisha. They were in her book. Like, no... She didn't, the reviewer didn't make them up at all. That did never happened. And so she piled on, she piled on this reviewer. This reviewer then wrote saying over a series of months since I posted this review, the author was threatened to contact my employer and she's orchestrated her followers on Twitter to comment on it, report it and contact Goodreads, etc. She's accused me of defamation and abuse although now all the comments have gone. The quotes I've given, obviously, from the book, and some are available online as PQ, so it's baffling to me why Kate denies all of them. The public accusation from Kate, I've organised a pile on with friends, is untrue. This was my honest review and was completely unrelated to any other reviews this book has received. Rather, I would hope that Kate and people who read this book without criticism can take some time to reflect on the racism, xenophobia, anti-Semitism, fatphobia, transphobia, and classism which run through the book. We are all continuously learning, but we must address our behaviours and be willing to do the work rather than deny them. Lastly, despite the threats, I will not take down my review. I feel and, and I felt and feel it was important to speak up for the young people that I believe this book lets down. This is incredible. So a reviewer highlighted actual passages from her book. Kate Clanchy piled on the reviewer, said they were made up, and yet Kate Clanchy is the victim. Just tell us a bit more about this, because I literally cannot believe it. <laughs> Do you know what, Owen? Just hearing you say it back like that and just telling me again what happened, um, I can't help but laugh about it because it is so absolutely ludicrous. And... I never imagined that it would play out the way that it did because it was so stuck. It was so clear from the very beginning to anyone who had seen what had happened, what had taken place. From the very word go, the first person to call Kate Clanchy's writing racist was Kate Clanchy. She saw the words, she took them as racist and she called them out as racist. She did, not us, she did. And then when she was challenged on it, when I think, I, I don't even know who it was, I saw uh, somebody else on social media replied with big screenshots from her book saying, but aren't these all in your book? She then replied and said, well, you need to read them all in context. And so four days after this happened, this was around the 31st of July, on the 4th of August, I checked my old tweets, I then saw this and I downloaded the book. I didn't have any intention of commenting on something that I was not informed about. I downloaded the book. I spent the entire morning reading it from start to finish. And I was absolutely horrified by the second page that this had gone through an agent, that it had gone through an editor, that it had gone through proofreaders, that it went through publishers, that it went through judges at the Orwell Prize. And not one person had called out what was written in the book. And so I then began to have a discussion with Professor Sunny Singh and Shimen Suleiman, who had also seen this conversation taking place. Now, in that four-day space, numerous people had commented. Many, many people had highlighted segments on racism. They'd highlighted segments where autism children are referred to as jarring company, where she talks about leaving two of them to do a task because she knows that they will do it undisturbed until she comes back. And she writes, this is fun. There were 
comments about children with Mongolian ferocity. There was enormous amount of sexualization of children. And that's where I then stepped in because I found it incredible that she had said, you need to read these quotes in context. And when I did read them in context, they were actually worse. Mm -hmm. um, there is one comment about a child having a fine Ashkenazi nose. Now, a number of people actually said, well, I have a fine Ashkenazi nose and I'm proud of it. But that wasn't what she was saying. She was disputing that a child called David Marx was Jewish. She challenged him on it. And she said she was baffled that he said he had no Jewish heritage, despite having black hair and a fine Ashkenazi nose. And the child said, I'm not Jewish, but she insisted that he must be because of his physical features. And that to me was incredibly problematic. And so I began to discuss this as a trio. And we went back and forth highlighting bits of the book that we found quite troubling. We had no issue with Clancy personally, but to us, her book was simply, as you'd said, symptomatic of how publishing is today. It's very white, it's very upper middle class, it's very nepotistic, and there are so few ethnic minorities or neurodivergent or just marginalised communities working in publishing that we were trying to point out that this is how books like this slip through the net. And we talked about it, we commented on it, and then of course the articles just started to appear about how she'd been piled on, how she'd been abused. We were called harassers, abusers, a lynch mob, um, and it just spiralled from there. And it was shocking. It was absolutely shocking to see because we were only three of a huge swathe of people who were commenting on the book. There was a, a child author who's autistic who had found segments of the book and put them up saying that he was sickened by them and felt so ill that he had to step away from social media and his mum had to take over his account because he had so much abuse. Mm -hmm. um, he wasn't mentioned anywhere. It was just three women of colour who were hauled up and called mm -hmm. the abusers. Um, something else that the press had completely ignored is the fact that hundreds and hundreds of teachers, head teachers, governors, and other educationists have signed an open letter to Picador highlighting their concerns about safeguarding around the book, which is a legality when you're writing about children. And that just went completely ignored. Mm -hmm. Everything in every article that was written was about her being cancelled and piled on and abused by us. And we were named. Mm -hmm. And to this point, there have been almost 34 articles written about us, radio programmes discussing us, with not a single person wanting to get our side of the story, um, with the exception of The Guardian, who within two or three days of this all kicking off, wrote to me saying, we've been following this from the start, we're absolutely horrified by the way this narrative is playing out, and we think that you need to have your side of the story. And I was exhausted by this point, I was absolutely drained. I'd had racist abuse on social media, I'd had racist abuse through my website, my husband was fielding my emails, um, I was trying to work in a full-time job and manage a three-year-old and a one-year-old. I was in tears quite regularly seeing people talking about me. Um, I had screenshots from a friend from Facebook where he showed me a number of white women authors talking about the cesspit on Twitter and how it had turned into a snake pit because of people bullying poor Kate Clanchy. And one of them was actually a former employer of mine. And she said, well, yes, I know. I gave her <coughs> her first job. And she suffered tremendous racist abuse there. And another author commented saying, well, I don't believe anybody should suffer racist abuse, but if she's one of those hounding clinchy, then she should know that paying it forward is not the right thing to do. And this was all quite shocking for me to see. And I, I was getting screenshots from people left, right and centre about people discussing it. Um, I tried to log off. Um, I had emails from friends in the US. I had WhatsApps from friends in New Zealand saying, are you OK? And it was impossible to step away from it. It was really hard to think that just by critiquing a book that was in the public domain, we were now being deemed as abusive and mm. harassing. And it was it was deeply troubling to actually see it happen. Um, and I think for me, the thing that has been most upsetting about all of this is that children were the centre of this. This wasn't fiction. This wasn't book of fiction. This wasn't anybody policing anyone's imagination. These were real children who were put in the care of somebody who was trusted. And they were written about in a way that laid bare 
all of the things that children often feel very vulnerable about. And when I read that book and I read about a young girl with facial hair and furry eyebrows and I think the words are a distinct moustache, um, I found myself welling up remembering how I had felt like that at school. Hey, Misha, this is this is very Sorry, no, 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 no. This is this is incredibly, incredibly difficult for you to, to talk. It's about. really hard to talk about it now, and I and I just sat there thinking, I don't want, I don't want my children. I've got two mixed race children. I don't want my children being written about like this. Of course, I don't want anybody's children being written about this. Um, I have a nephew who's um, got ASD, and I know how hard his parents have been fighting for his school to treat him as an equal. And I read those passages and I teared up and I just found the whole book so difficult to read. And in fact, this morning, I have a friend who's been rereading the original copy for me. And she said that she's been feeling suicidal over the last few days because it's reminded her of how she was bullied at school and all the things that made her absolutely hate herself. And I told her to just throw it to one side and just forget about it and go watch some Netflix. Um, but I think what people have just obscured so much in all the articles that have been written about this and even said, you know, oh, but 25 of her children have written in her defence. It's just 25. She's taught a lot more than 25 children. And I have seen children actually write to her on her Twitter saying, I didn't like the way that you wrote about me, but she's ignored those. And those children have just been swept under the carpet. And also a lot of those children um, didn't even feature in the book. They're just mm -hmm. children whose poetry she has she's published. And I want to make something really clear, and I said this in my Guardian piece back in August, none of us had any issue with anything that Clancy has done with students in terms of poetry. The, mm -hmm. the, all the anthology she's published, all the work she's done with them mm -hmm. is very commendable. We had no problem with that. We still don't. And it is. I personally think it's quite sad that those books aren't available right now, but I'm very certain someone will pick them up. To me, the problem was that one book and the way that those children were written about and that's something that has also just been completely ignored. And now it's about the children being silenced. The narrative is now that the children's poetry has been cancelled. The children are now being silenced by us. Um, and that's absolutely not the case. The fact that the books are not available anymore is simply a very straightforward result of when you part ways with the publisher. Your rights are returned. It's as simple as that. You have the rights back. You've not been cancelled. You've just been given back the rights and you have the rights again to give to another publisher. And, and and she has got another publisher. Swift Publishing is now doing her book. Her, her mm -hmm. latest book mm -hmm. is already available in the book. It's never been out of print. Mm -hmm. It has been available consistently throughout mm -hmm. the time that she has said she's been cancelled. Mm -hmm. The book was available when she was doing interviews. People could still buy it. And the book's going to be published again in, in paperback soon, as will the poetry at some point. So this idea that she's been cancelled is simply false. I should say, by the way, Manisha, I'm really in awe of your courage because this isn't easy to talk about at all. You've gone through a, a really grim experience and it is shocking. It's, it's the gaslighting and all the rest of it. And I think, and I'll ask you towards the end about, just shortly about um, the wider point about the publishing industry, the systemic mm. racism with it, because the point you made about you and others who have these obviously understandable visceral responses because you've endured this sort of mm. racist abuse from a very early age, is there wasn't anyone who'd had those experiences reading these passages. Since, and then obviously a problem would be flagged. These were all white privileged people who, and you know, this point, you, you know, almond mm. eyes, chocolate colored skin, fine Ashkenazi nose, Mongolian ferocity, big Afghan nose. Like, the, and, and the point you made is the first person who publicly, in a sense, other than reviewer, said these were racist were Kate Clanchy herself. So just on that, the, the facts, that defenders of her book refuse to acknowledge anything wrong, mm. even when presented with screenshots and quotes, and then how fast the media closed ranks and protected her. We've got here, for example, the Times, Kate Clancy, we teachers are tough, but being cancelled pushed me to the edge, abandoned by her publisher. The author reveals the agony of seeing a Twitter storm destroy her career, as you said. This I've been silenced tour, it's a classic genre. It's, uh, it's where someone says, I've been silenced, I've been cancelled. On the BBC, as they say that on the BBC, in on, t on radio interviews, in, inter in repeated interviews in the press, features, comment pieces, all coming to her rescue as she says, "I'm being silenced." I mean, that's the point, isn't it? I mean, what that, that what does that yeah. say about the media closing ranks and about how the defenders just don't 
even though Kay Kalanchi herself was originally shocked that anyone would suggest these things could be written by her because they were so awful. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what's so ludicrous. Also, what's in the last week that has come out that is very ludicrous as well is the fact that she said she was cancelled, but equally in the Sunday Times interview that she gave, said that she found the rewriting process cathartic and that she enjoyed being able to edit the book. And since all of this has happened, big chunks have been taken out of the book. The bits about the autistic children have gone. The bits about the Ashkenazi nose have gone. The chocolate scholar skin. I don't know about the small skulls, the narrow skulls, the large skulls, the Mongolian ferocity, or the bits about how a child who was a rape survivor ha was being talked about in the room as having you know, lost her looks since it happened. I don't know if any of those things have come out of the book, but they were, they were horrifying. And she's taken them out, which mm -hmm. to me suggests that if you did take them out, then we were right to have highlighted these things. So either you've been cancelled or you've learned from the process and you've edited the book accordingly. But it can't be both mm. of those things. Choose one. Which one is it? The fact that you, Clancy has been afforded this backstory about how awful the things she's gone through in her life and how... And I'm not here to denigrate that. Like, you know, people do go through terrible, terrible experiences. And it's not even when people do things which are wrong, it's not to not show empathy and love and compassion to people. But the point is that's been showcased in her case. But when it comes to you and other women of color who spoke out about this, you haven't been afforded that. No, we're just this one dimensional monolith of aggression um, with absolutely no, we just weren't afforded the same kind of humanity that she was. And we really suffered um and i can't speak for I, I won't speak for them because it's not fair but i suffered enormously in august i was ill for a couple of weeks um it's the closest i've come to thinking about self-harming in almost five years um i had to go to my gp and talk about it i've started therapy again um because it's very hard to see your name being dragged through the dirt by somebody um who is profiting off the back of that and you know, I, I I was working full time. I have small children and I had to just shut down my laptop and smile at them and pretend that nothing was happening. And they were so aware that I was unhappy and mm. it had a huge impact on my family and mm. my extended family as well, who are hearing from other people. I, I kept it from them. I always keep these things from them. I don't want to upset them. But then other people tell them. And my mum called up and said, I've just been on the phone to someone who interviewed me, a friend of yours. And she said that she's really proud of you for what you're going through. What on earth is happening? My heart just sank and I thought, oh God, I don't want to have to talk to you about this and upset you. Um, but it was so far reaching and it's distracting more than anything. You know, we don't enjoy doing this. And I think this is what people don't understand. We hate, we hate, viscerally hate seeing racism, hearing racism, and then having to call it out and talk about it. It's so physically draining. And I want to spend time with my kids. I want to be doing colouring with them and doing jigsaws and talking to my husband and making dinner. I, You know, Shemaine wants to be working on her book. She's got a fantastic book that's coming out soon. Um, Professor Singh wants to be working with her students and travelling to Brazil to visit her family. She doesn't want to be doing these things um, any more than, you know, you want to be talking about homophobia, explaining it to people and telling them why you're a human being on their level and ought not to be written about in this way. And that's all it is for us. It's just we're not a big group of woke karate or, you know, abusers or a lynch mob. All people are saying is, please stop writing about us this way. Stop writing about us like this. Stop writing about our children like this. Don't look at our communities in this way and use our communities as a way to challenge, in, you know, your own bigotries. Because that's what the book was. It was essentially she was trying to use these children as a vehicle to challenge her own prejudices. And to me, that's not OK. You, that's not what children are for. Children are not there to teach you how to get over your own bigotry, especially not ethnic minority refugee children. Um, and one of the, the biggest things that has come out of this for me is the fact that they, you know, a lot of people have said, you know, that the children's agency is being ignored. The children have a right to say that they support their teacher. And of course they do. They absolutely do. Um, and the, the student who wrote saying, I'm I'm the student with the almond eyes, and she described me beautifully. She then does say in the next paragraph, I wouldn't dare to talk about other students on their behalf. 
And that's been obscured as well. Um, but also when you're a child, your dynamic, the power dynamic between a teacher and a child is so different from that dynamic when you then think back to it 25 years later. And I, when I was reading that book, started to think of so many white middle-class teachers I had in Yorkshire in the 80s. And I started to remember things they'd said to me as a child, um, singling me out, calling my parents up to tell them that I was aggressive, um, that I was a liar. Um, and I started to see them for what they were. And it's taken me 25 years to do that. And I am in no way disparaging what those children have said. And some of them may well say in 25 years time that they still stand by everything that she said, and that's fine. But it's a very relevant point that people do take a while to process when something has happened to you. And when you ask someone at the time whether or not they feel good about it, they might tell you that they do. Maybe it could be out of fear, it could be out of any reason, a loyalty, um, but also specifically ethnic minority children. In, in Asia specifically, and I know this from being from an Indian household, teachers are revered. Teachers are placed next to God. Academia is next to godliness. And you are made to respect your teachers in the way that you respect your parents and your elders. So to ever go against that or to see them in any other light is very unusual when you are young. Just finally, the point about the publishing industry, this is a point all of you were trying to raise mm. attention towards. The fact is, I mean, look, I work in the British media as well. And if you look at the demographics of the national media, according to the government's own statistics, and I think this links very much to the points you're making about the media closing ranks, because mm -hmm. what the statistics show about the national media is that it it's only medicine um, is less socially exclusive, uh, sorry, more socially exclusive than, than the media in terms of parental backgrounds. Um, Repeated studies have shown that people of colour are woefully underrepresented within the media, particularly in position, you know, when you go higher up, but reporters and so on as well. Um, and that's also in the publishing industry. So anyone who's, there's quite quite a funny video going around recently of uh, uh, a guy's working class writer saying, um, if you want to, uh, if his advice to working class writers, he sort of face solemnly and he goes, Oh, I saw it. Yes. Yeah. He said, Hurrah, he says, everyone says hurrah. Just don't, go with it. Don't get angry or defensive. Soon you'll find yourself saying it. But he was just making it. I mean, it is a very, very posh yeah, it's industry. True. Posh. It's, true. it's really true. But I think, so, um, yeah, go on. So, sorry, some, someone asked me the other day, one, one of my best friends from school actually said, would you do this again? And I did have to sort of pause for thought. Um, but actually, I would because I have so many dms on twitter and emails through my website from young people working in the publishing industry people at picador people at bloomsbury people at penguin people at random house writing to me saying thank you for what three of you did i can't say anything publicly because i'm really scared about losing my job and i feel really grateful to be here but it really helped seeing you three do what you did because now i feel a little bit more bold to be able to say something in the future. We're too scared because we're bullied by authors or editors or anyone within publishing. And I still haven't even responded to all of the ones that are backed up since August. And it was heartening in one sense, but also really deeply depressing that people are feeling like that. But I spoke out because I feel like I've reached a point in my career where it's not going to suffer if I say what I do. I have a really strong agent behind me. My editor at Bloomsbury is a lovely person who fully backed everything that happened. Bloomsbury have been really solid behind all of this. And I don't feel like my career could be impacted by this, but I know that younger people would. And five years ago, I wouldn't have said anything. I'd have been far too frightened to say anything about this at all. But I feel now that because I have this position and I've got this privilege and this platform, that I have to use it in the right way. and. While obviously I wouldn't have it play out the way that it did, um, I'm not going to stop doing this. I'm not going to stop calling this out because I don't want other people to have to go through this again. And I don't want children to be written about like this again. Um, I also don't want any of the next generation to be having these discussions um, and being distracted from their work because all of this is distraction. And I don't I want people in 10 or 15 years time to just be doing their work and getting on with things and not being sidetracked by these conversations where essentially all you're doing is trying to say 
I'm as human as you. Please talk about me and write about me and treat me that way. I have to say, Manisha, just just to to finish up, I, I'm really in awe, as I've said, of your of your courage, of your determination. You and the others you mentioned have gone through a huge amount. You did nothing wrong, nothing wrong. Um, it's it's shocking how the media and elites in particular have closed ranks around her rather than supporting voices like yourself. And it is one of these incidents and or, or kind of I don't know how to describe it um, sagas where history will look back and go, wow, you know, this was just shows how this is, you know, you know, you know, when we look back at thirty years, it varies incidents and sagas that happen and it's very revealing about dynamic power dynamics at the time and how far things had to go and this just shows you know this just shows the huge problems of systemic racism within the media within the publishing industry about who is treated as the victim um who is martyred as a consequence who is vilified um but there's no question that because of your efforts this will help empower other people to speak out. And it's important that allies speak out to support you and the others. Um, but this will have a big impact. I, and, and I think you should be so proud of that. So it's such an honor to be able to talk to you about, about the truth of what happened. Thank you. Thank you. G genuinely, thank you for letting one of us actually have our say. And I, I, I really do feel like that something huge has lifted off me to be able to talk to someone who's not out to stitch me up or <laughs> to to uh convey something other than what happened so yeah thank you very much for that it's good just to just to speak about the truth and that's what we try to do today so lots of love manisha take thank care you. Thank you. take care bye-bye thank you so much bye